And we move to questions to the Minister for Social Development, and I call Mr. Danny Kinahan. And can I inform members? Sorry, members. Uh, question four has been withdrawn, so I call Mr. Kinahan. Thank you, Raj. Question number one, please. Mr. Speaker, when providing permanent or temporary sites for Irish travellers, the Housing Executive has legal obligations to take into account both the needs of the traveller community and of secure tenants. Under Article 28A of the Housing Northern Ireland Order 1983, the Housing Executive has obligations to provide such caravan sites as appear to be the appropriate for the accommodation of caravans of the Irish traveller community. Article 40 of the Housing Northern Ireland Order 1983, the Housing Executive has obligations to consult secure tenants about the changes that affect them. The member will be aware that an assembly adjournment debate on temporary housing sites in Antrim has been tabled by Mr Trevor Clark and is scheduled for Tuesday the 3rd of February and that follows on from some correspondence which I have received from Mr Clark in relation to this issue. Thank you. And I call Mr. Kenahan for a supplement. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Speaker. And I thank the Minister for his answer. And I know when I put this in, we weren't sure when the debate was going to think. So I know there'll be a little bit of duplication, but there are rights and responsibilities on all sides. But have other sites in Antrim actually been considered? And are, they, are you or your department considering other sites in the future if it is indeed a temporary application? Uh, thank the member for the supplementary. In terms of, of other sites, and maybe because I just say in relation to this particular uh, situation, there has been a considerable concern expressed by, uh, I have to say, the council, uh, by elected members, and this is an operational issue for the housing executive. And I think it does raise the way in which, under emergency uh, regulations, under emergency procedures, uh, situations like this uh, occur. And when I've read through some of the, the comments that have been made and the concerns that have been raised, it certainly does uh, give the uh, view or the impression that uh, there would have been uh, a better approach if it had been identified in a way which was with the community rather than imposed on the community. But that, this is an operational issue uh, for the Housing Executive and uh, I will uh, check with the Housing Executive before the debate tomorrow night uh, in regards to the specific in relation to other sites that were considered prior to the decision being made to use this current site in, in uh, Rathen Row. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for his answer. The Minister, in your response there, you did talk about the travellers' rights. However, each and every MLA in this, this room or assembly today will be inundated with inquiries about the rights of ordinary individuals who have housing stress and housing need. What is the housing executive then doing to address their needs? Are we going to see more camps set up to actually alleviate the pain and suffering of ordinary individuals within our own communities who are actually under housing stress? Uh, thank uh, the member uh, for his question and also for the way in which he has raised this particular issue uh, following on from concerns that uh, he has, has raised. In terms of the issue, uh, in terms of rights, I think that uh, we need to always have a balance in terms of this issue that no section, no particular group has an exclusive right in these situations and that the concerns that are raised by uh, local residents uh, in a, a stable and in a settled environment are not uh, completely ignored and that those concerns are taken on board and that yes there is an obligation as I said in relation to the current legislation uh, for the housing executive to operate within that legislation but that should not in any way undermine or underestimate the right that they have to take into consideration due regard to other uh, people who live in settled accommodation. Uh, Mr. Speaker, in the interest of equality and, and sort of balance, and given there's been a lot of representation uh, on the side of the community, can I be so bold as to ask about the rights of the travelling community? 
and how their needs are assessed, given that they have been travelling the roads of Ireland for hundreds of years, perhaps a lot longer than some of the people who complain about them? Uh, well, I assume that there is a question in that there somewhere. Uh, uh, let me maybe answer the question because there is almost an assumption in what the member is saying is that this issue is ignored and that this is an issue that uh, is somehow being treated in a very trivial way. It has not been treated in a trivial way. And maybe if we could have an understanding as who it is that determines, for example, the accommodation needs of uh, the travelling community. The housing executive has responsibility for uh, the establishing the accommodation needs of the travelling community throughout the comprehensive traveller accommodation needs assessment, which is a, in itself uh, a, a fairly uh, wordy uh, description of trying to meet the needs of a particular uh, section of the community. But the Housing Executive commissioned comprehensive travel or accommodation needs assessment in 2002 and in 2008. And in fact, I understand that a third comprehensive needs assessment is expected soon. So that will give us something of uh, a view as to what currently are the needs of those who are within the travelling community. Um, just on the back of comments made by the Minister's party colleague, Mr. Trevor Clark, can I ask the Minister to distance himself from the comments where highly offensive comments were referred to ordinary people? I think that uh, you know it, the comments that have been made uh, in terms of uh, the issue in relation to the travelling community. I think I prefer to address what is the core issue here, and that is how we have come to a situation where uh, these concerns have been raised. How do we work with the community, including, I have to say, uh, some of your own colleagues in Antrim Council who have expressed concerns uh, about this situation, and find a resolution in a way that addresses the needs of those who are travellers. Thank you. And I call Mr. Chris Hazard. Cash over to Little Hull. Question number two. Uh, thank the member for his question. Indeed, this question is quite uh, topical, as members may be aware that the issue will be the subject of the Public Accounts Committee meeting on the 11th of February. Uh, Trinity Housing Association received uh, advanced land purchase grant uh, totalling £835,215 on the 27th of February 2008 for the purchase of a site at 19 Downpatrick Road, Cross Gower, on the basis of a 12-unit social housing proposal. Due to a prolonged process with the planning so service over site uh, character issues, objections and amenity space, the site has not been developed. Oakley Trinity are currently drawing up their proposal for refunding the grant, which will be submitted to the Housing Executive this month for their consideration and for their approval. Hazard for a supplementary. Can call and, I, and I thank the Minister for his answer and indeed uh, for his work on this issue and, and putting plans in place to recover the funds. Of course, the, the funds were given across to meet the demand for social housing in the South Town area, particularly around Cross Gar and Lachan Island. Will the Minister now pledge to use the money uh, once provided, the money recovered, to ensure that social housing need in the Cross Gar and Lachan Island area is met going forward? I thank the Member for his supplementary and, and obviously uh, I am keen. Uh, to see uh, a resolution to this issue. Uh, it is a substantial amount of money. Uh, I have to say it will be interesting, and I don't want to preempt uh, anything that will happen in terms of the Public Accounts Committee, but I think we will see some interesting uh, information being uh, conveyed at that particular uh, meeting. As far as meeting the needs in the area that the member refers to, I remain committed to ensuring that where that need is identified, where that need is brought to the attention of my department and to uh, housing associations and the housing executive, and indeed, I have to say, uh, to uh, co-ownership as another means of ensuring that we deliver good quality housing to our communities, then uh, I trust that I will not be found wanting in ensuring that that need is, uh, where possible, addressed. Um, 
Surely, Minister, you've got an assurance from the Department of Finance and Personnel that if this money is to come, that it will be uh, spent uh, for social housing. Well, well, I think that I have to wait. I think it would only be uh, due diligence on my part to ensure that I wait until we've got a conclusion to this matter. And uh, you know, the housing executive has been uh, closely monitoring the progress of this scheme and has been aware of the issues surrounding, for example, the planning issues. And there has been, and this has gone on for now a considerable period of time. And the, uh, the housing executive wanted to afford to the then Trinity Housing Association every opportunity to achieve a successful planning outcome. However, uh, we find ourselves in the position where now the uh, Housing Association will have to come back and put before the Housing Executive plans as to how they are going to address that. When that happens, then uh, decisions can be made in terms of what happens in regards to the future. Thank you. And I call Ms Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer so far. Can I ask the Minister, since uh, its introduction, how many advanced land purchases um, have been unsuccessful and settlement required? Thank uh, the member for her uh, question. And I think this is where uh, part of the, the good news story, but also part of the challenge that there is around the ALP. There has only been two ALPs to date where grant has been paid out, but schemes have not progressed. One of these was Trinity, the site referred to at 19 Down Patrick Road, Cross Gower. The other ALP was for a helm site on the Great George Street in Belfast. And a settlement plan has been put in place to ensure the full settlement of the grant paid. And I have to say, in terms of, of that uh, particular site, that is uh, substantially more than the current site that we are referring to in terms of Downpatrick. In fact, in regards to the St George's Street site, it is 8.1 million uh, by the end of 1617, which will involve the offsetting of the ALP grant uh, paid against uh, future schemes. To date, in regards to that scheme, uh, 1 million 554,000 has been recovered. Uh, the housing executive has advised me that they are not aware of any other cases other than the Downpatrick and the Great George's Street where the ALP scheme was approved. And an ALP, an e ALP payment was made and the payment subsequently uh, had been removed. Thank you. And I call Mr Stephen Agnew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number three. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. There are no target league tables or incentives used in determining whether individual claimants will have their benefits sanctioned. A decision to impose a sanction uh, on a benefit claimant will be made by a decision maker in the Social Security Agency and will be based on the relevant regulations and individual circumstances uh, of the case. I also refer to the nine previous answers on uh, this particular matter in relation uh, to sanctions. Uh, the latest being in November 2014, which also state that there are no target league tables or incentives used in determining whether individual claimants will have their benefits sanctioned. Mr. Agnew, for a supplement. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the minister for his answer. And I suppose, Minister, the reason why you face persistent questioning on this issue is because similar assurances were given by UK ministers, but the evidence is coming forward that whilst the policy was not to use, uh, 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 to use incentives, that they were being used in practice. Can I ask the minister, has any investigations been done by his department to ensure that the practice of using um, incentives in league tables isn't operating? Uh, I thank the member. Obviously, we are in a, a, a process where we are constantly <coughs> viewing the issue uh, in terms of what happens in the rest of the United Kingdom as far as the rollout of welfare is concerned. It is something which, on a day and daily basis, we endeavour to uh, keep ourselves appraised of. But I think that it might be useful to outline to the member uh, particularly what proposals will be brought forward on the benefit sanctions under the proposed welfare bill. Uh, and as members know, uh, the bill will uh, come back to the House uh, uh, next week. 
and uh, I'm sure you'll all appreciate I'm looking forward to that uh, and want to ensure that that, as was said previously by the Deputy First Minister, that we make progress on this issue, and I think that's vitally important. But under universal credit for claimants who are subject to all work-related requirements, there will be three levels of sanction, higher, medium and lower. The higher level sanctions will be imposed on claimants who fail to comply with their most important labour market requirements, such as failing to apply for a vacancy or, or failing to accept an offer of work. The sanctions will be made for uh, three months for the first failure, six months for the second and 18 months for a third uh, failure committed within 52 weeks of a previous failure that resulted in a 26-week sanction. Currently, sanctions for these types of failures are generally set on a case-by-case -case basis and can be between 1 and 26 weeks. The reform makes the, conse the consequences of failure clear and stronger. And then there is the medium level uh, and then we have the lower level. I'm quite happy to give the full detail because I'm well aware that I'm running close to the time. But what I will do, I, I will give to the member the full uh, answer in relation to the higher level, medium level and lower level uh, after the debate. Indeed you were, and I call Maurice Devenny. <laughs> thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for his answers so far? Can I ask the Minister how is ATOS, ATOS incentivised to meet his contractual obligations? Uh, uh, the I thank the, the member for his question. And, and, and ATOS provide medical support services under a contract with the Department for Social Development. The contract has a robust performance management regime and includes joint monthly, quarterly and annual performance review meetings. ATOS does not make decisions on benefit entitlement. They provide professional medical advice to the department's decision makers who use this and all the other available evidence to make a decision. There are a number of contractual service levels, such as the length of time to complete an assessment, the quality of the assessment and the claimant uh, satisfaction. Where performance does not meet the contracted levels, financial penalties are imposed. The level of reported customer satisfaction is consistently above uh, 90 per cent. Each month, an independent market research company randomly selects claimants and seeks written feedback about the ATOS assessment. ATOS performance is also independently monitored and evaluated by the Social Security Agency Health Assessment, and currently ATOS are providing a good standard of medical quality. Okay. And I call Mr. Loris Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, <clears throat> Minister, you had attempted to outline some of the flexibilities pertaining to some of the sanctions, but can you give this House an assurance that uh, we will have our own bespoke model of sanctions and not actually impose the higher rate of sanctions as outlined at Westminster? Well, I think that uh, what is vitally important that when members will see the bill when it comes back to the House uh, next week is that every effort has been made to ensure uh, two things. One, that we ensure that we do have parity with the rest of the United Kingdom in terms of the, the framework of the legislation. But secondly, that following on from the Stormont House Agreement, that we have put in place uh, measures, mitigating measures, to deal with those areas of concern. And I think that uh, I've also given, uh, in terms of the, the five party or the five leaders agreement in relation to this issue, and it should be remembered I think members in the House need to remind themselves of this, that there is a five leaders agreement in relation to this issue, that uh, a lot of work will have to be done in terms of the regulations. And I can assure the member that there are many hundreds of those uh, in terms of how we roll out what is a very complex and a very challenging uh, process, both in the legislation and in the timetable. But I can give uh, the member an assurance that I am doing all that I can to ensure that people are informed, to ensure that people uh, manage in terms of my department and how we deal with this. We manage this uh, process in a way that is uh, focused on the people of Northern Ireland for whom uh, it will deliver a service to. Thank you. And I call Mr Basil McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Minister said that he's keeping abreast of things on a day and daily basis in the United Kingdom. Um, is he aware of evidence before the Committee for the Department of Works and Pensions that you are much more likely to get sanctioned than you are to find a job 
and the fact that sanctions are actually ineffective. Would he care to give us assessment of that evidence? Well, obviously, we have seen, and I referenced to this earlier on, we have seen a number of uh, we have judicial reviews that are ongoing. We have uh, various uh, elements of implementation across the rest of the United Kingdom in various uh, parts where there it seems to be a difference in terms of how, in one part, uh, it is being uh, played out. There is evidence being taken by the Select Committee uh, at uh, the House of Commons. There has been comments uh, over recent days in relation to the issue of sanctions. I have to say, we, we need to keep the focus here, and the focus is about ensuring that our welfare system is constructed in such a way that it is not a barrier to work, that it does not become a society that is dependent upon having the access to that uh, welfare system. However, that it is a safety net, that it is there for those people who uh, do have those needs. And I, I, have, I can sit very comfortable, comfortably with that, but I also believe that where the system uh, is in place, then I think that those uh, necessities for a sanction are appropriate, and I believe that they are still there and should be used when appropriate. Thank you. And I call Mr. Marchin and Muller. Uh, okay, Kesh de Krug, question five. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The task force chair is scheduled to uh, brief the Social Development Committee on the task force report on the 12th of February, and my department will publish uh, it shortly after that. And given this, it would be, I think, inappropriate for me to comment uh, extensively on the task force recommendations until then. But what I can say is that my department has taken uh, the uh, recommendations in the task force report very seriously, and we have actually begun to take some of those actions forward on a number of the recommendations. And we are working on an action plan to implement the remainder, which will fall within the Department's responsibilities as soon as possible. Before Christmas, my Department also responded to a request from the Housing Rights uh, Service, who currently run the Mortgage Debt Advice Service, for additional funding of £15,000 this year to meet an increase in demand for the advice service that they provide. Thank you, Mr. Mueller, for a supplementary. Thank you, Minister. Um, and, and if I caught you right at the end, you're saying you, you acceded to that request for the 15,000, and I welcome that. Um, I think that it's clear from the Minister's answer that our sympathies are with those who find themselves in neg negative equity, who find themselves losing their home, sometimes through no fault of their own. We're talking about ordinary people, as the Minister understands. Our, the people we serve are all ordinary. We don't distinguish between traveller or settled, black or white, whatever religion people have. And I would ask the Minister, would he continue to push as hard as possible for those who have really lost out in, in the boom? We help the banks, as the Minister knows, those who made the loans. Will he, will he give a commitment, a continued commitment, to make sure we give as much help as possible to those who lost their homes? I thank the member for his comments. And, and I think that uh, you know, if we look at the task force recommendations in a, in a broad sense, uh, there were 20 recommendations covering a broad range of issues. And many different sectors, organisations, including the mortgage lenders, the borrowers, the advice sector and government, all have a role to play in improving the position for borrowers in uh, mortgage arrears. And I think the task force uh, set itself in terms of its work, if we look at what it focused in around the two core objectives, uh, helping and encouraging people to help themselves and increasing the number of people who seek help at an early stage. And, and I think that in terms of uh, what will take place uh, uh, when the report is published, I think that the member will see that there is uh, a focus on ensuring that we use all possible mechanisms and means to help those who are in need and that those who have a responsibility will not be allowed to uh, in any way abdicate the responsibility, but that collectively we try to ensure we put together a set of pa a package following on from the recommendations which are there to help and not to be a hindrance. Well, Mr. George Robinson. Mr. Speaker, could I ask the Minister who is to blame for Northern Ireland having the highest levels of mortgage arrears in the United Kingdom? <laughs> well, now, uh, there is a question that uh, 
could take some time, and I think it maybe follows on from, from the comments made by the member opposite. Uh, I think it's, it's neither uh, possible nor maybe appropriate for me to assign blame to a single sector or group of, of people. And obviously, we came through a very difficult and a very challenging uh, time. The housing market bubble of the period from 2004 through to 2007, and then the subsequent downturn uh, was a result of, of a number of factors. And all those involved, and I've made reference to them already, whether it be the mortgage lenders, the regulators, the bank, the uh, borrowers have contributed to the current uh, mortgage debt landscape. And it is a challenge for us, and it's something that I think we shouldn't uh, in any way uh, underestimate. I think that's why we were keen to set up uh, the task force. I think that's why the recommendations will uh, be helpful. Uh, but uh, there is an onus uh, on all those organisations that uh, we made reference to, to learn the lessons of the past, not to replicate them. And I do have concerns when you see the housing market, uh, particularly in parts of uh, the rest of the United Kingdom, uh, beginning to heat up again, that uh, we wouldn't be long in a cycle. We wouldn't be long in a process of time until we found ourselves back in a situation where there were uh, families and there were uh, people who were facing those particular challenges. Caution is always a good policy to have, and I think in this one uh, it is certainly something that should take us in the future to a place where people recognise their responsibilities but also realise that there are uh, others who have a responsible attitude that they need to display so we don't get back into the same position and the same problems as the past. I call Ms Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Minister, people facing mortgage arrears in the rest of the UK have access to a wide range of interest-free loans and other initiatives which have not been available to homeowners here. Even a £2 million fund could offer support for £5,000 could have helped 400 families here. Now, that compares favourably to the £10 million co-ownership co scheme in next year's budget, which will allow up to 330 new homes to be purchased. So, Minister, can I ask, why do you believe that a relief scheme is not important in Northern Ireland? Well, I think that what we need to see in terms of uh, the, the various elements that, or the various tools that we use to address this particular problem uh, I, I'm, always or I'm always cautious of making sure that you put uh, all your eggs in one basket. And I think that we need to have evidence that will lead to a decision that is based on an assurance that we're going to get an outcome. And I've had discussions with uh, the co-ownership uh, uh, people here in Northern Ireland. In fact, I intend to meet with them very soon. because. One of the big challenges that we will face in Northern Ireland over the next number uh, of months is the future of our housing policy. And the member will be aware, as members of the House are aware, that there is a review uh, currently going on as to where uh, all that may take us to. And I have decisions to make uh, that will structure and will put a framework for the future delivery of good, affordable housing, not only, I think, in terms of the uh, public sector, which we have a responsibility for, but also ensuring that we create the environment where, in terms of the private sector, that there is progress being made. And I do honestly think that we are not going to exclude any potential plan, any potential scheme but there needs to be evidence based that by in introducing a particular scheme uh, that we will get the necessary outcome and we will get the necessary buy-in from uh, the sector that gives to them the confidence that progress can be made and we will actually deliver a good product. Order. Uh, we're, we're just short of time to uh, put the question, so uh, we move on to topical questions. And I call Mr. Basil McRae. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, is it not the fact that the Minister's Department takes the lead for fuel poverty? Um, given this, can the Minister explain why there has been substantial reductions in the wholesale price of energy, but these have not yet been passed on to our people? And perhaps he would explain how he plans to tackle this. Uh, thank the, the member. I'm glad that he thinks that I have such a power over uh, those who are the suppliers 
uh, of uh, oil and gas that I could command them to uh, see a reduction uh, in their prices. We are seeing uh, a reduction, certainly if you look at uh, home heating oil, if you look uh, at uh, some of the other forms of energy supply, we are seeing uh, a reduction. However, he does make reference to the issue of fuel poverty, and, and we, shouldn't, we shouldn't underestimate what uh, is a, a huge issue in terms of fuel poverty. And if you look at the three contributory uh, parts that would make up uh, the issue of fuel poverty, uh, income, fuel prices, and energy efficiency. So my department has introduced a, a new, the new affordable warmth scheme to improve the energy efficiency of homes, of those vulnerable uh, households uh, most at risk of fuel poverty. The affordable warmth scheme is primarily a targeted scheme at households uh, with an income of less than £20,000. Uh, in 2011, the House Condition Survey shows us that fuel poverty rate in Northern Ireland uh, is 42% as opposed to 15% in England. But almost 70% of households in Northern Ireland rely on oil as their main source of heating compared with England. So while I welcome that home heating oil costs are now at a five-year low and have reduced to 2009 levels, this will have a positive impact on low-income families. But we wait to see it being rolled out further and certainly any encouragement that we can make to the suppliers to continue to go down that road, we should do that because it certainly will have an impact. A piece of work that we are doing is we are now looking at, uh, given the reduction in the price, what impact is it having? on those figures in relation to Obviously. fuel poverty and I hope to be in a position very soon to give some response in relation to that. Thank you Mr Speaker. The Minister seems a trifle confused in this matter as he finished by saying the fall in the wholesale price of energy has happened. What has not happened is that it has not been passed on to the consumers and when it comes to the situation 42% of the homes in Northern Ireland live in fuel poverty, but that's because we use the 10% measure. Can I ask the, measure, the Minister if he thinks that is the appropriate measure to assess fuel poverty, or should we adopt the English model, and should we be doing more to make sure that our most vulnerable get the benefit of falling energy prices? Well, I certainly believe that we should be taking every advantage to ensure that the most vulnerable in our society gets the advantage of the falling prices. But I think that we also need to remember that we have a high dependency uh, on one particular fuel. Let's remember that many of the people, and you're not comparing like with like in re reference to the rest of the United Kingdom, because in the rest of the United Kingdom, many of them have access to gas and have had for a long time. And the member will know that uh, the concentration of the gas network in Northern Ireland is primarily focused around uh, the city of Belfast, and we haven't seen the rollout and the possibility of that being made available to other parts of Northern Ireland. And so I think that whether uh, the uh, success or whether the rollout of this to the benefit of consumers in Northern Ireland would, I would like to see it uh, quicker so that we could have an impact on fuel poverty. But I would remind the member that the three component parts of how we identify uh, fuel poverty still remain income, fuel prices and energy efficiency. It's not all just down to one particular element that the member has focused in on today. And I call Mr. Colin Eastwood. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his uh, answers thus far. Uh, can I ask him if the, the target on social housing new build will be met? Well, obviously, there is going to be a, a, a huge challenge for my department in relation to meeting the target for social housing. And uh, every minister that has come to the House uh, in recent days uh, uses the same reason, and that is the issue in regards to the, the budget. And I think that if we see the reduction that there has been in my own department's uh, budget, that has created a challenge. And I do have a concern that there will be uh, a, a challenge in terms of meeting that target. However, that won't deflect away from the focus that we still need to have about delivering uh, the uh, targets that we have set. But what I, I would be more interested in ensuring is that we continue to focus around the delivery of good 
affordable homes for uh, the people in Northern Ireland, and we do it in a way which gives them confidence that we are moving in the right direction. We're moving away from the days when, when you look at the, the, the stock that we have in terms of the housing executive, and uh, in the next number of weeks we will be seeing, I believe, from the Savile report, which is giving us a stock condition survey of where we're currently at, of those who are currently in housing executive properties, there is a huge need for a huge investment, not only in new build, but also in existing still. Commissioner Eastwood for a supplement. Thank the Minister for his answer. And I suppose you know, even some people would say even if we do meet the targets, then we're still uh, not meeting the, the real number in terms of what we need to be. Uh, building across the north, and in my own constituency in particular, that's very, uh, very stark. Uh, one way some people would suggest to try and alleviate some of this is, would be to allow uh, and support the housing executive to find creative ways, maybe of borrowing money or whatever, to build uh, new houses. Uh, does the minister have a view on that? Yeah, thank the member for that. In, in terms of, of the rev uh, reform programme that we're currently engaged in, in terms of the housing executive, I have met with the board. I just met uh, last week with the chief executive and the chair, and uh, obviously uh, we're in the process of them presenting to us an interim investment strategy and looking at the overall and the long-term future of the housing executive. And I am keen to listen to the uh, almost plea that has been made to me by the housing executive that we give to them uh, new uh, tools, we give to them new uh, structures that would enable them to be able to do more in terms of investment, uh, because one of the arguments that they have, and I think have had a, a good cause or a good reason to make this argument to us, is that they believe they haven't been able to do what others have been doing, and they have felt then somewhat undermined by that. And, uh, in, and I would like to make progress with this uh, in the coming weeks and months to be able to be in a position to give to the housing executive uh, a different model uh, of delivery, not only in terms of new build, but also in, in the way in which they can generate money so that that can be invested in the current stock. No one should be under any illusion of the huge challenge that there is in terms of maintenance in the housing executive. We all, as members in this House, are well aware of the complaints, of the issues that are raised with us in terms of housing executive tenants, and I'm keen to create a new future for the housing executive, uh, and maybe uh, to give the member some sense of where the housing executive uh, is at on this issue. Uh, they now have divided their operations into their landlord function and the regional function. I think that's something that should have happened a long, long time ago. And so the executive, I believe, is making progress in Two terms of that, and I hope that that will contribute to a new model in the future that we can all agree to. Thank you. And Mr. Ross Hussey is not in his place, so I call Mr. Morris Deveni. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answers so far. Can the Minister provide me with an update on the Tully Alley Community Centre in Londonderry? Uh, I thank the member and I thank the, the, the member for his interest in, in relation to uh, the issue in his constituency and I, I also thank him for the opportunity to visit uh, the city of Londonderry some time ago and to see first hand uh, what was going on not only in Tully Alley but in other parts of the city and the member also has an interest I know in terms of what goes on in the fountain and uh, I believe that uh, we will have some good news for uh, the, the fountain in terms of uh, where that will go. You'll know that there was an announcement made in relation to an urban village and my department is going to work through that. But in regards to Tully Alley, we have provided uh, 200000 to meet the majority of the cost of the refurbishment of the Tully Alley Community Centre. And, uh, I have to say, and they say you should never kick a, a, a gift horse in the mouth, but uh, as far as the 200000 was concerned, that was a substantial investment, a lot more than what the City Council, I have to say, contributed, which was 20000 uh, And uh, I have to say that was uh, disappointing that all they could find was 20,000. However, 
the work is now progressing. I believe we will put back into the heart of Tully Alley a centre that will give that community hope. It will give them a focal point where there will be a wide variety of activities take place. And I was very encouraged by the work that was going on on the day that I visited uh, Tully Alley. And I look forward to coming back very soon when the work is completed and the building is up and used uh, for the benefit of the community. Mr Devaney for a supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I say I'm delighted with the Minister's response? And I would say ask the Minister to come down and visit the centre when the work has been completed and see for himself the good work that will be carried out from that centre. And it is a very vital community resource for Tully Alley. Well, thank the member for the invitation. I'm always glad to be on the road. Uh, and uh, it makes a change uh, from being uh, in the city. I have to say, since I came to the office, uh, I have spent a considerable amount of time uh, in, in the city, both east, west, north and south. Uh, and I understand I'm planning to, to go to south uh, uh, next week. But uh, the invitation, I thank the member for it. And I think, uh, on a serious note, in terms of, of the, the Tully Alley Community Centre, uh, it is disappointing that it got to the point uh, where uh, it had got to in terms of the condition of the building. I am well aware that there were huge challenges around uh, legal issues and all of that. And I pay tribute to my own staff in uh, the North West Regeneration Office for the hard work that they did to get us to the point where all of this has been delivered and the money was secured. So I look forward to going to the Maiden City and to visit Tully Alley. Thank you. And I call Mr John Dallet. Uh, Mr Speaker, the Minister will be aware that Homelessness is back in the news again today, and given there are 18,000 people presenting themselves as homeless, one third of them with children, can the minister tell this house what sense of urgency there is about this terrible, shameful problem? Uh, I thank the, the member for his uh, question, and, and he's absolutely right in terms. Over the last uh, number of days, there has been a particular focus. You will be aware that the event that was held in the City Hall, where there was a call by uh, the current Mayor of the City for a coordinated approach. Uh, you will have seen the, the comments made in terms of uh, the need that there is. And, and I have to say that I am committed, and uh, I will be happy to give the member this assurance that this is an issue of vital importance. It is something that can't be ignored. I think that there is a huge amount of good work that has been done by organisations to uh, at least deal with the issue in an interim period. There is always going to be the challenge for us as to how we deal with this uh, particular issue in a long-term way and in a very strategic way. And uh, The Housing Executive has its strategy. But strategies are all well and good. They have to be implemented, they have to be managed, and they have to be uh, put in place. And certainly, I do believe that we need to continue to keep the focus on the issue of homelessness in a way which keeps people at the centre. And always let's remember that when we use statistics, when we use phrases like homelessness, we are talking about real people who have particular issues and some very complex issues. And, uh, I do not underestimate the challenge that that creates for us all. Mr. Dallet, for a supplementary. Speaker, I, I thank the Minister for, for his answer, and clearly he does demonstrate a sense of compassion for those people who, through no fault of their own, find themselves without a home. Can the Minister assure us that in the future the voluntary organisations such as the Simon Community, St. Vincent de Paul, the Salvation Army, and others are centred to helping? Re, uh, solve this terrible problem? Yes, I can, and I think that uh, there is uh, clearly a, a vital role for those organisations and others. Uh, and I know that, uh, and without naming the particular organisation, uh, I visited uh, just before Christmas an organisation in this city which does an outstanding job in terms of the way it provides for people who present themselves as homeless. And, uh, I intend to do more work uh, with 
uh, that particular organisation and others, but I can assure the member that the organisations that he makes reference to and others uh, will continue to work with my own department and the Housing Executive and other statutory agencies because this is an issue we can't ignore. This is an issue that won't go away, but this is an issue that we need collectively all to keep a focus on because, and I repeat the issue, and I, and I don't want members to think that I'm repeating it because it's simply words, but let's remember, this is, they're real people that we are dealing with here. I saw, I saw uh, the Simon community had a, a billboard just uh, before Christmas, and it said that we need to all remember that we are only one wage packet away from homelessness. And there are some people who could be very dismissive of that, but I think it's a telling reality. And when I went to this particular location in this city and I walked through the door, I saw someone from my own town that I never thought I would see in such a set of circumstances. That was a very, very stark reminder to me of the issue that we face as a society. Order, time is up. Thank you, Minister. And, uh